Uh huh. I think listen, I talked to the guy one day. He was all the time talking about how his dad was this way to him, that way to him, all hard on him, everything. And I'm, I'm, I mean, I met with this guy for a lot of times and just telling him about Jesus and the cross and the resurrection. And that stuff was nice to him, but it wasn't penetrating this thing with his dad. And then all of a sudden I said, well, have you ever considered that you're Jacinta? Jacinta. Yeah. No, you, I'm just saying, I, maybe somebody might, I don't know, taking it wrong or maybe I took it wrong. Jacinta, hold on, stop. I'm going to explain this. Jesus is the faith of God. Right. Faith of God was in Jesus's heart. In expounding on what Jesus believed, that belief is born in other people. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's not a willpower thing. It's a learning about the Father by seeing what Jesus believed in his heart. That's explaining the faith of the Son of God. Paul said he lived by the faith of the Son of God. He lived by this faith that was seen in the Son of God. So the Son of God, Jesus, had a certain faith in his heart. That faith was put on display on the cross, in the resurrection, all of that. And speaking about the faith in Jesus's heart is the preaching of the heart of God or the gospel. And that's how faith comes to people's hearts. Faith comes by hearing. So I don't see it. It's, it's different than what you're saying. If you're talking about the belief Jesus had in his heart, that is setting your eyes on Christ. That is setting your eyes on God. That is seeing God, mm -hmm. right? That is explaining God. That's talking about who God is, all of that, right? right? Yeah. And so what I would just say is I would encourage you to consider that there's more than one way to express what you're saying. And the Bible expresses it a lot of different ways over and over and over and over again. I think we confuse Christ. I, I just got to be honest. Christ didn't just come into existence when he was made flesh. It says Christ was made flesh. So Christ was before he put on flesh. Well, guess what the whole Old Testament is? It's still Christ. Guess what Jesus read as a human to learn about the Father, the Old Testament. So Jesus looked at the Old Testament and he learned about the Father. It says he grew in wisdom and stature. Well, where did he grow in that wisdom and stature from? He had his eyes set on a certain thing. And this thing he had his eyes set on taught him about the Father. Right now, he is the manifestation of the thing he had his eyes set on. And now our eyes get set on him. And now we learn about the father by having our eyes set on him, just like he learned about the father by having his eyes set on the spirit in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And so describing what Jesus believed is preaching the faith. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, a good message that you preach that I've been listening to. I think it's from last June. I want to say the 16th. It's called looking at the law through the eyes of Jesus. And I listened to that message last year so many times, but this year it is so much more clearer. And it was so beautiful to see the way that Jesus looked at the law and it put his heart to rest. And we can look at the same thing through the carnal mind and it causes us to labor. So yeah. it's all in your mindset. If you have, it, it's just like I just read in Revelation 1 where Jesus appeared to John on the Isle of Patmos and it says his eyes were flames of fire. Now, if you read that in the carnal mind, It'll scare the bejesus out of you. <laughs> but when you know that the fire is God's love, it's like, oh, my goodness, I can't wait to see those eyes, you know? Uh, it is just so beautiful. Um, I just wanted to um, give the scripture that Maurice was talking about, the, the brass serpent. Jesus said to Nicodemus, he says, um, the, in verse 14 of 3 in John, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him or looketh on him uh, should not perish, but have eternal life. 
And in Isaiah 45, the Lord God said, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. And so Jesus was fulfilling that. Look unto me, God. This is God doing this for you. Yeah. Mm. And then I've got one more thing to say. I don't know if you said it on Sunday because I was in and out. I've got to listen to it again. But you were talking a little earlier about God doesn't uncover our sin. He covers it. And when you said that is all I could think of was Ham. When I don't know if you mentioned it, how that Noah got caught. And uh, Ham went in and saw his father's nakedness and went out. And, you know, he was demeaning his father to his brothers. And his brothers backed in with a blanket and covered up his father's nakedness. And, yeah. you know, the scripture says, love covers a multitude of sins. Love yeah. always covers. It never exposes that's mm. right. And I might be wrong, but I think Ham is the father of Nimrod. I believe so. Or the grandfather. Yeah, Nimrod is from the lineage of it's Ham. He's the descendant. He's the descendant, right? Yeah, he's the descendant yeah. and a close descendant mm -hmm. because it wasn't that long after right. they right. go to build the Tower of Babel. So Ham is uncovering Noah's nakedness, yes. and then he ends up having Nimrod in his lineage, which, I mean, it's debatable, but you could say Nimrod is maybe the most filled with the serpent's wisdom of a guy that there was walk that ever walked the earth. Right? Yeah, example yeah. of someone being lifted up in their heart. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. 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 Yeah. Jacinta raised her hand. Go ahead, Jacinta. I was just going to say, but to me though, uh, it sounds like uh, just maybe I'm not saying that's what you're saying. I'm just saying that's what it's sounding to me that Jesus had like he had a faith. But for me, it's like he is the faith. He if he had a faith, that means that I have to. Find some God and find the faith because I feel like without knowing that He's the one who is the faith and He's the one who gives me that faith, He's the one. I mean, through Him that faith was revealed. I feel like He came and said, "I am the faith. I'm giving you that very faith. I'm giving you myself." Otherwise, I can't say, "Oh, He uh, just like Paul believed in a faith. He had some kind of faith, and that's the faith that I need to go seek out." Or it happens automatically by me hearing. I feel like that just makes it sound like. He's no, this is no different than Paul or any other other prophet. But the only thing is for me is like Jesus is God Himself, the very God Himself, and He said, "I'm coming down to Earth because Jacinta. in order for this to happen, I saw I'm looking at it." Like, oh, it's, Jacinta, Jacinta, hang on. Yeah. Just, Christ is the manifold wisdom of God. He's the many-sided wisdom of God. You're only looking at Jesus as God. Jesus also came as the Son of Man. So Jesus is the faith in the flesh. But he's also what a human looks like with the faith inside of his heart. Mm -hmm. And so you most certainly do identify with Jesus, the son of man. Right. And I think we talk every week about how Jesus is the faith sure. and how you set your eyes on the faith. Right. right? Yeah. That faith was made flesh in Jesus, but that faith was also in his heart. How are our eyes going to get set on it by talking about what it is? So when do we talk about what it is? We talk about by what's in his heart. That is revealing the faith that is Jesus, right? And if we just eliminate the many-sided wisdom of Christ, and we only say Jesus is God, and we don't look at Jesus as the Son of Man, which the Gospels most certainly spend a whole Gospel talking about Jesus, the Son of Man. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we're the Son of Men, right? Yep. And so there's many ways to explain Christ. Right. And you don't just take one and hide out on one. You take the other ones and you point out the other ones. Sure. Right? right. And then you talk about that also. So anytime you're talking about the faith that was in Jesus's heart, that is setting a person's eyes on Christ. Right. That's the whole point. He said, I'm the truth. So when you talk about what the truth is, their eyes are getting set on Christ. Mm -hmm. So I, I I'm struggling to see what you're saying there. And I'm, I'm, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but I'm struggling to see why you think that it's bad to talk about the faith that was in Jesus's heart. No, because I'm not saying it's bad to talk about it. I'm just saying the difference to make, to be clear that to every human that 
it, it, it was like it, it was he it, he's fully God and fully human, but we we are fully humans and we're his like, children, like the little gods. But I feel like sometimes it's I don't know if that's how I'm. It just that's how it's coming off to me. I'm not saying we shouldn't look at him as he came as human, which fully I see that he came as human. Otherwise, he couldn't fulfill what he wanted to fulfill. My just my whole point is that. Oh, yeah, I should just let it go. Um, just do that. Yeah, kind of on to topic number two. Yeah, just since I, I don't, I, I'm struggling, I'm, again, I'm struggling to see why you think that it's not having your eyes set on God or Jesus to talk about the faith that was in their heart. It's the faith that was revealed in Jesus being God. Right. And so you talk about it. That's the only way people can hear it. It says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word that is Christ. Mm -hmm. And so the only way people are going to find faith working in them is if they hear what it is. Okay. Right. So you can describe God on the cross and describe the cross from the perspective of it being God, which we have many times, and you can hear the faith that way. Because you can hear God's heart as God is there laying down his life on the cross. But you can always also describe the faith that was in Jesus's heart as a human being. Right. That also <laughs> reveals the truth about God. And faith comes by hearing. So talking about the faith that's in Jesus's heart is the same thing as describing God. And so it has the same effect. Yeah. And being that we're humans... It helps us to see what this human, as a human, thought about God. Right. Because we were created for the same relationship with this God. Yes. Right? Exactly. And so you talk about God, you reveal Christ straight from the perspective of God. You, I could come in next week and preach God on the cross. I just preached God on the cross, didn't I? Yeah. And you could come in the next week and preach about Jesus as a man on the cross. Right. And you could preach about the faith in Jesus' heart. And people would hear it. And then they could be persuaded about it. The very word faith, the root word of faith means to persuade someone else of something. And so you talk about what Jesus believed about God. Now you're talking about the truth about God. People can hear it. And then that truth can persuade them. Right. And so. The, the scripture that I, I think I gave last week uh, in John 15, in verse 9, Jesus said, as the Father hath loved me. Now, what Jesus is saying is, as I believe the Father's love for me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. So what Je Jesus knew, it's just like when Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. He went in the power of his Father's word at his baptism it says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In the power of that word, he went and he was tempted by the adversary. And he said, if you be the son, turn these stones into bread. He didn't have to because he knew who he was. He was feeding on the father's word for him. He lived in the reality of who he is. And so Jesus says, as I have lived in the reality of my father's love, it's produced this love toward you. Now you go and continue believing in this love that I have toward you. And then this love will be born in your heart toward everybody else. We feed on Jesus just as Jesus fed on the father. Amen. 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 Okay. Where should we go now? I know that when you preached this uh, week, Greg, that I posted a couple things on my Facebook about, you know, God is only good to us. And I got a couple of hits from people I used to go to church with. And it, I mean, I hadn't heard from them the last year. Right. But um, it was a really hard thing a hard saying for them that God is only good to us and that they, be, they believed they were persuaded in their heart that God uses pain and suffering to teach that God uses 
um, trial and tribulation to put them in a correct spot with him. And it was just, uh, I guess, having heard Grace for the last year, it's been warming my heart and warming my heart. I'm like, no, he is only good. He's only good. And those things are not coming from him. But I've had to hear that a few times. So I'm kind of at that place now where this, it's, it's, uh, it's audacious to say such a thing, that God would not use the pain and suffering that I found in my life to be the tool by which I came to see him or be healed. Now, just because the affliction's there doesn't mean he gave it, but there's that assumption, right? That almost expectation because of the teaching. So maybe you can talk to that a little bit, but I felt kind of, I felt frustrated. You did. I almost commented on your post, but I had to reframe myself. That's not my post. That's not my post. That's somebody else's thread. I'll just reframe. (laughs) You know, the same thing happened to me at the gym the other day. I was exercising and the woman came over and started talking to me. And she was saying how strong I was and how she couldn't do what I did because she has this disease and all of that. And I says, are you a Christian? And she says, yeah. I says, can I pray for you? I believe in divine healing. You know, God doesn't want you to, to, to suffer. And she says, oh, you know, she says, I really feel this is my ministry. You know, I can help people uh, that have this kind of thing. I says, listen, lady, you could uh, minister a lot more if God heals you and you receive this divine healing, then you are going to have the faith that what you received, you can freely give. And I'll tell you, they would much more enjoy being healed than being taught how to cope with their suffering. I said, well, but hey, whatever blows your doors open, honey, you know? Well, it's not whether, it's not that she could be a more powerful minister if she were healed. It's, it's more that if she just believed God's not the one who gave it to her. Yeah. Because it doesn't, a person doesn't require to be healed physically to be a powerful minister. A person could suffer with an affliction and be a very powerful minister. Oh, absolutely. But what she's ministering is death because yeah. she's saying God gave it to her and God's given it to you. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, the, I know what you I just wanted to, to make it clear. But back yeah. to what Lisa asked, what yeah. a sad state it is that it's Christians who had a problem with her saying God is only good. Right. right. And, and yeah. Yeah. And Sorry. So, they, they were also saying it's affliction, chastening, disciplining, kind of all lumping that together. And it was like, whoa, you have a lot of things you just put into a great big boiling pot and blame God for all of it. Or, you know what I mean? Or saying that those are his tools. And, and I was just. But, but yeah. notice what, what Paul says. Uh, we won't say Paul, the author of Hebrews. Um, <laughs> Yes. He says that we have earthly fathers who chasten us, and he describes like penal yeah. type of punishment. Right. right. And then he says that's not how God is. Mm-hmm. Right. And yet, then we, when we think of God's chastening, we think of it just like we would think of the chastening of a man or of yes. an earthly father. Right. He says who they do it for their own good. Right. right. They do it for their own benefit. But the whole letter to the Hebrews is the chastening of God. It is his discipline, right? And what did Jesus say? God didn't come to clean the outside of the cup. He came to clean the inside of the cup. So what was wrong in the inside of the cup? The inside of the cup is we were busy thinking that we had to labor and toil to give ourselves life. So the chastening of God, this is so horrible. It's so painful. The chastening of God is he comes and says, listen, you don't need to labor and toil to cleanse yourself. I've cleansed you from your sin. Mm -hmm. That's the chasing of God. He sees us trying to clean ourselves up for sin, right. and he comes with the good news of how he's cleansed our sin. See, he's chastened us. He's corrected yes. our belief system. We think we're orphans. He comes and says, no, you're my son and my daughter. Right. He's chastened us. Right. We think we got to labor and toil to be justified by our works. He comes and says, I've justified you by the word I spoke about you. He chastened us. We think that we got to clean ourselves up from sin, and we got to perform all these things to be blessed, He comes and chastens us. He says, I've given you all things freely in Christ. We think we need to make a name for ourselves by our good works. And God comes and says, I've made a name for you in Jesus by my good work. He disciplined us. He chastened us. Now, doesn't that sound horrible? All that chastening. (laughs) Right? Now, listen. 
The only, the only purpose a chastening would come is to bring about repentance. Yeah. Can everybody agree with that? Even yes. the people yeah. who say God brings badness. Yeah. Okay, the only point you could have, this is how you get checkmate. This is like in the art of philosophy, what they call checkmate. You get them to first agree with the smaller point, and then that smaller point connects to the big point, checkmate. Right. Yes, yes, I agree. The chastening of God is always to bring repentance. Well, go read Romans 2, 4. It says the goodness of God is what leads us to repentance. Right. Yes. So his chastening is his goodness towards us to heal us from what we couldn't heal ourselves from, to seat us where we couldn't seat ourselves at, and to give us the thing we couldn't get for ourselves. That's his chastening. He reveals his goodness towards us. That brings about a change in our mind, and we stop trying to cleanse ourselves from our sins. We stop trying to prove that we're good by our works. We try, stop trying to exalt ourselves by our works. We stop trying to save ourselves from the death in the world. We see he's saved us. That brings about repentance. And so the whole point of the letter to the Hebrews, it was these guys were still doing the animal sacrifices. They were still trying to cleanse themselves from sin. Now the author came and chastened them by telling them, God's cleansed your sin once for all time by the blood of Jesus, man. Enter so, into rest. There remains a rest for the people of God. Right. What is that rest? You think you need to cleanse yourself from sin, but God has cleansed your sin once for all time. He was chastening them. That's the chastisement of God. Now listen, if you were a Jewish guy, all the time out of your mouth you claim God. You have a zeal for God. You're all the time, we're the people of God. Now should a person come and tell you that you're busy doing the thing that's anti-God? It could be grievous for a time, yes, right? right? Like you could feel in your heart, like they do, they rip open their sackcloth and mourn in ashes. Oh, Lord, you know? And so it's not that the chastisement that God brings is of a punishing or penal or a negative thing he brings into our lives. He does, that's not that the gospel is the chastening of God. The message of the good news is the chastening of God. He chastens us with the message of his goodness to save us from sin and death and give us eternal life as a gift free from our works. He chastens us with that. It corrects our belief system, right? Yes. Now, if you're busy thinking you're doing everything right for God and you're busy thinking you're the people of God and you hear the thing you're doing is actually anti-God, listen, that don't feel nice for a period of time. Yes. Right. right? I remember when I was busy thinking my ministry was found in my running and I was going to get all these gold medals and world records. And then, then my ministry would go from there. And I was busy thinking the gospel was about having mansions and cars. Not that you can't have that, but that's not what the gospel is. The gospel isn't the means to that. Right. It's not that you can't have it. I was thinking that's what the gospel was all about. And God came and he chastened me. You know what he did? He said, Greg, man, you realize if I came and offered you my peace and my love and my joy and my kindness, and I offered it to you as a gift, or I'd offer you these gold medals in this mansion and these, these cars and all this money and the box of Wheaties. You realize you take the box of Wheaties, right, Greg? Oh. <laughs> you see, because in my heart, I thought I was after God's way. Yeah. You know, and I, and I was frustrated in the backyard with a broken foot thinking, how can I fulfill God's calling on my life? I can't complete the will of God now. I was suffering, and he came and chastened me. He chastened me by revealing the belief in my heart hadn't come from him, but it had come from the world, right? And he did that because he wanted my heart to be set free, right? His goodness. Does, does everybody understand? I preached the whole message a long time ago about Hebrews, the, ch mm -hmm. the chastening of the Lord right. yeah. is what I call it. I yeah. probably just explained it a lot better. But you know, uh, Thank you. Thank you for saying yeah. that and explaining the grievous. Thank you. Because that was the big part, the hurtful part. The hurting in the heart was the grieving. And the grievousness seemed to be the suffering. But that's not that's not what's happening. Upon yeah. correction. Upon correction, there's a realization, oh, I got it wrong. Ugh. And that's, I definitely, thank and you. And you, br you bring up the grievous. The author would have brought up the grievousness because he's busy realizing how difficult it's going to be for these guys to repent. Yeah. Yes. Right? Yeah. Because when you're busy thinking you're doing something for God and you're busy actually with wood, hay, and stubble, oh. and the fire of God comes and reveals the wood, hay, and stubble you're busy with, it can be difficult to repent because you don't want to believe. And so he's telling them, listen, you might feel that this could feel grievous for a period of time. Yes. And it's going to be difficult for you to repent. 
because your whole life has been built around all these traditions and your whole culture is telling you this is the way to know God. And they might even reject you if you don't, if you, if you give this up. And so it can feel grievous, right? That's the whole point. You know that word chastening there in Hebrew 12, it is a pedio, where we get the word pedi pediatrician. And it means to train up a child, yes. to educate. So, I mean, how do you treat a child? You know, I mean, you, you train them up uh, with love and kindness. It's not... Uh, putting something rotten on them to teach them something. It's like right. the whole the whole education of a child. That's what I read it to be too. I looked it up too. I was like, it's the whole education, not just the slap on the butt to get behavior. It was like, it's so much bigger than that to try to chase it. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful word. Yep. Yep. Okay. We have a question here. Hang on. Go ahead. Hold on. Wait, wait, hang on. Go ahead, Sherry. No, I didn't have a question. I was just going to make a statement. Sure. Go ahead. I was going to say like a while back, um after she spoke that, that basically this is um they they don't believe they don't really believe in christ that's it they don't believe in christ and they say they believe in christ but they don't because when you believe in christ you let go of everything else like for example i have a planner and i've been writing my planner writing my planner writing my planner i'm going to do this i gotta do this i gotta do this well i forgot to write in my planner a couple days and I did everything that I was supposed to do because I let God do it for me. Mm -hmm. Every, I, didn't, I don't even use it anymore. I don't use my planner. I wake up in the morning and I'm like, okay, you're going to help me remember what I need to do for you. And every day it just falls into place. And it's amazing. Why would you even want to live that way and try to work hard to please God? Why? Why? Because it's, life is wonderful when you let it go and believe in Christ. Amen. 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 You know, my um, my first, turning red. My my first acid test in my heart of hearts, working hard for him, um, for ten years. <clears throat> in my heart of hearts, I knew for a fact that I did not love him with my whole heart, my whole mind, my whole soul. I did, I loved my hunting dog more than I loved him. If I was honest with myself, my dog accepted me better, more unconditionally than the God I thought I knew. Mm -hmm. The God that I was taught who would punish me and um, teach me lessons. <clears throat> I can say uh, now, I mean, I love him so much. I adore him more than there anything in this entire planet and i i love what um i think it's lisa said last week i've i've, I've giggled at it all week long and then she said <clears throat> back to the garden i thought that was the coolest thing um and so i yeah i just I, i'm gonna make a sign that says back to the garden i'm gonna hang it on my front door <laughs> i think that was ricky or maybe it was lisa yeah, yeah, it was, it was one of the two of them. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. They both say such great stuff. Whoever yeah. it was, thank you. I loved it. We loved it. Well, Greg said it first, right? <laughs> Greg said it first. Thank you, Greg said it first. Anyway, awesome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, anybody have any else they'd like to bring up? I would like to bring something up. Okay. And that is... Um, so many times people want prayer okay they want prayer they want you to pray that they have peace they want you to pray that they wouldn't fear and in communicating with them you know that what they need is to understand the father you know, as I said the other day, your heart cannot go to rest unless you receive a word that causes it to rest. But there's this, this mindset that, you know, prayer will do it. 
but you can pray and pray and pray. But if that person's heart is not established in the father's love for them, then they're not going to have the peace that passes all understanding. What do you think, Greg? Yeah, I mean, I pray for them to know Christ when they ask me to pray for them to have peace because yes. I'm knowing Christ, they'll have peace. Amen. Amen. Right? Yeah. And right. then sometimes I'll feel led to pray words about Christ that bring peace. Yeah. Right? And then they can know Christ sometimes through my prayer. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So I can pray for someone to have peace by praying what brings peace. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Like yeah. I can lay my hands on somebody and pray about what God's done, what God said. Right. I could see what's in their life that's maybe trying to steal peace from them. And then I can pray what God's done to conquer that. And then they can hear what I prayed. And then that can be born inside of them. Right. It isn't going to so be like what, a you, what you're saying is it's a stealth invasion. Yeah. It's not like a magic wand moment. So many times I know you think it's a magic wand moment. Well, we'll just pray God for peace. He'll come with the magic wand. Poof. Mm -hmm. The way God will bring peace to you is he'll come and reveal himself to you and what he's done to set you at one with him in his life. Right. And then that will give you peace. Right. Pretty right. much all of Paul's prayers did that to everything. Yeah. Right. And that I is such you, a powerful thing. That is so powerful, Greg, what you just said. I hope everybody hears this because that is real wisdom. When somebody is asking for you to pray for them, just like, like your, your prayer is just going to make everything cool to use that opportunity to speak that word that you know has the power to bring that peace or that um, uh, rest from fear into their life. That was beautiful. Because Christ is the intercessor. Yeah. And so when we're struggling in our hearts, it talks about the Holy Spirit interceding in our hearts with groanings that can't be uttered. Many times when a person's in darkness or the darkness is around them, they don't hear that voice that's trying to groan inside of them. But I know what that voice is trying to groan inside of their hearts. So when I pray on them, pray over them, I can speak the words of Christ, which is the words of the Spirit. And that can intercede in their heart, except the groanings are out loud now because they can't hear it on the inside. Right. But also a lot of times um, people will feel comforted just from prayer, right? Mm -hmm. Just because I know the long-term solution is for their heart to be persuaded I also know that right then in that moment, they could feel comforted also just by me praying, right? So I factor that in, in too. But yeah, I'm very aware that it's not a magic wand moment. It's not as if God's withholding peace, and if we yeah. can pray, it will come and poof, give us the peace. So many times we say we want this, we want that, or we, we want the other. We think God's not doing anything. God's been busy unwinding the thing that's keeping us from peace for years. Amen. He's been busy working on the fear that's stealing are the feeling stealing love from our hearts or stealing uh he's working on the he's all the time doing it it's not like we got to get god to come and do it right. right he's been trying to do it i mean people all the time were like man i just need god to do this and it's like they find me from ex some obscure place on the internet and i said well do you think maybe that it's kind of strange you found this little hole in the wall church in slidell louisiana if you think it's kind of strange, you somehow found us. Have you considered maybe that God is busy answering your prayer? Yes, He's right. busy bringing you to a place where you can hear the thing that's going to set you free. Oh, right? I mean, we, the, it's not a magic wand thing, right? Well, I, I, well I was going to say, I, I tell you from personal experience, and probably Cindy could agree, that when you have prayed for us, the many times that you prayed for us, it's when you pray about who Christ is in our lives that it's had the greatest impact. Yeah. So yeah, just a personal testimony to that. I pray what I pray when I pray, I pray what God's done to conquer death. Amen. I pray the resurrection. Yep. I pray what he's done to see this at his right hand. I mean, I I just pray who he is. I pray what he's done. I pray the spirit. Yep. That's what I'm busy trying Amen. to do. And the glorious thing is the people don't need to know exactly how the thing works for it to even work. Right? Right? Exactly. Yeah, you told us. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys already yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted I wanted to jump in there about prayers is I think because we all think we have a way we think we need to be saved. And so we want to pray for what we think we need. We want our circumstance to change. We want the other person to change. We want the money, the health. And what God wants to do is give me his eternal life. And so what I find I do, I think I love what Yolanda 
you said it's just a communication and I think prayer is more for us than it is for God do you know what I mean because he knows every cry of our heart and I always pray I just thank you father you'll show whoever it is what they need to see to trust you and you'll persuade their hearts to believe who you are and you'll earn their trust and you'll heal them in the integrity of your character I find, and I, I find I pray it so much, it feels like it's a generic spiel, but I feel I know that's from Jesus, you know? I'm not saying I don't pray for healing or I don't pray for this, but I know most of our hearts are, we think God's holding out on us because we want this thing in our circumstance to change, but we really want love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, and I'm not saying the outside thing can change. But I know a conversation with you, you're like, well, why do you want those things, Dawn? Because you want love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness. But you're just seeking it through the carnal way, the, you know. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, I will tell you, Dawn, I've adopted the, your prayer that you've prayed most frequently, and that's just, help me, Jesus. <laughs> Lord. You know, you know what I wanted to add? become part of my repertoire. <laughs> Go ahead, Gwen. No, wait, hold on. Let me oh, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, we'll carry an hour and we got into pressing the real um, Lisa, I'm going all the way back to Lisa. And, and I just consider the verse always that there's no shadow of darkness in him. Mm. And darkness is, is that. What, what right. they're accusing him of is a shadow of darkness. So yes, that, that verse right there seems to answer that. And then also, I so well relate with that groaning, that grieving, when you thought you were lined right up with God and everybody else just get behind me. Mm -hmm. And then you realize all of a sudden, oh my gosh, you know, I'm so far from that. Yeah. That is a very grievous time. It, it's yeah. beautiful like what you say. Based on the, the lies we've been taught about chastening, it's as if we could say, God gave the demon to those guys because yes. he was chastening them. Right? Oh. But then when Jesus comes casting out the demons, yes. they accuse him of casting out the demon by the power of the angel book. Yes. And Jesus makes a profound statement. He says, the house divided against itself can't stand. Exactly. I can't be the one who gives the demon and the one who heals the demon. Right. So God can't be the giver of the sickness and the healer of the sickness. He can't be the giver of the bad circumstances and the healer. He's not both, man. Right. He's not. It's not like a circle in the yin and the yang both. Yeah, that's right. He's not. He's not like, he's not like some uh, Middle Eastern, you know, yeah. religion where there's a, a yin and the yang and both. No, no. In God is light and light. I love what you say. There's no shadow of darkness in right. Him. Right. Right. Every perfect gift comes from, from above. above. Yes. 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 Right. right. Okay, Gwen, jump in. Well, what I was going to say is that um, this is simplifying things, uh, bringing everything, boiling everything down to the, to the final essence of why Jesus came. Um, today, when I did my little study, I did it from the perspective of what um, Greg said, that I have come, that you may have life and that you may have an abundance. Well, the issue was is that we didn't have life. Right. And when we used to hear this scripture, we used to hear it as this is our carte blanche to get houses, cars, lands, and all of that, when that was not what we lost in the garden. <laughs> God provided everything for Adam and Eve before he even put them in the garden. Their need was already met. And so <clears throat> the issue was that we were dead and God wanted to bring us life. He wanted to rescue us from the power of death. And this message that I heard um, has actually set me free from trying to work a plan to be healed. Mm. As I was laying there listening to Greg teach this message talking about Abraham, my symptoms and the things going on in my body is testifying something to me. It is testifying to me of the resurrection life. So rather than me looking at my symptoms and looking at the things that's going on in my body as a testimony that I lack life, I wake up and I laugh because I know that I have the resurrected life of Christ living in me. And 
it does not, it has not appeared that way because it didn't appear that way with Abraham. Abraham was good as dead. Yep. Sarah's womb was barren, but God had already declared something over him. I have made you the father of many nations. Abraham believed God, but he has declared something over me. Yeah. That I have joined you to myself. You are now united with me. You were united with me in my death. And now you are united with me in my resurrection. Therefore, this symptom that is going on in my body is a testimony for me. This is the way I see it. I saw it backwards. I saw it like uh, Jesus showing me the backside of something. Don't look at the symptom as proof that you don't have life. Look at the symptom as proof that resurrection life is yours. Mm. I have life. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I wanted to bring out with this message, the reason why it was so powerful to me is that in Hebrews, I'm telling you, it boils down to two things. You either got life from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or you got life from Christ. Now, the, the tree of the knowledge of good, we tried to do that tree. I mean, we tried to, to try to work principles because we wasn't looking at what God said. God said, if you eat from that tree, the good side and the bad side, you shall surely die. But what was we busy doing? We was busy working principles trying to get life through working these good principles. We were working principles on how to raise our family, how to have a good marriage, how to get close to God. We was working principles on tithing and giving and all of these things from the good side of that tree. And it was killing us. So God simplified it for me and said, there's only, there's only two issues, life and death. Adam lost it and Jesus regained it. And this scripture that he gave me today is talking about Hebrews 2, 9, 15, or let's go to 14. He says, since therefore these his children, he calling us children, y'all. We are his children. I mean, we are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. I don't know how close we can get. We're yeah. one with him. We've been united with him. His resurrection life is resident in us right now. Yeah. He says, therefore, since these his children share in flesh and blood and the physical nature of human beings, he himself in a similar manner. That's why he had to become the son of man. In a similar manner, partook of the same nature that by going through death, he might bring to naught and make of no effect him who has the power of death that is the devil. And also that he might also deliver and completely set free all those who through the haunting fear of death were held in bondage throughout the whole course of their lives. Yep. Mm -hmm. Jesus has set us free completely from death. And mm -hmm. I want to just give you back your word, Greg. I'll be your Huckleberry. I'll be, you tell hell I'm coming and I'm bringing hell with me, tombstone baby. This is what our God said to Satan when he was prophesying to him. He was saying, uh, uh, oh death, I will be your plague. <laughs> I'm going to plague you death, oh grave. I will be your destruction. I'm going to ransom them from death. I'm going to redeem them from the grave. And didn't he do it? Amen. <laughs> we are now living through the life of that last Adam, who is the life-giving spirit, resident on the inside of us. So I'm not looking at the cross anymore in the light that I used to look at. I'm looking at the one where he says, set your mind on things above, where Christ is seated. Yeah, that's right. The resurrected Christ. So my mind is not even on my symptoms anymore because when it comes up, I laugh. I laugh because it's 
proof to me. It's proof to me. You trying to get me to believe I, I lack life. That's right. So when I pray for people now, I pray for them. I say, Father, I thank you for, for the resurrected Jesus because this lack of peace is because of the fear of death. Whatever malady that mankind is experiencing, whether it be lack of peace, lack of love, lack of joy, lack of the life of God is because of the fear of death. It's a, a life and death issue. And I thank you for bringing it out in that message on Sunday because it's like, it's like night and day. It's like God made a mark of a demarcation, just like it was light in Goshen and dark in Egypt. He says, I'm breaking this thing down so you could see it real clear. That's, and that's, that's what I got from it. So yeah. keep, keep, Amen. keep preaching, Greg. I told you, get it as get as excited as you see me getting excited <laughs> right now. And loud, get it, make it louder because dead people is the ones that don't make no noise. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you, you, you see, the way you would look at the cross, you see the symptoms would try to tell you you lack life and you're separated from life. Right. Whatever effect in this world you see in your life, the fruit of death, whatever you see, you would want to see that on the cross and see yourself dead to that, meaning seeing yourself dead to any word that tells you you're separated from life, right? That's what it would mean to consider yourself dead to sin. When it says consider yourself dead to sin, the wages of sin is death and the fruit of death. So the way you consider yourself dead to sin is that when you see death anywhere in your life, you consider yourself dead to that, meaning that I'm separated from death. I'm not joined together with death. That's not what, I'm not braided together with that life. I'm braided together with eternal life. And so you consider yourself dead to sin. You consider yourself dead to death in every word it can speak. So if I got some arthritis going on in my hands and that's trying to tell me that I lack something I need for life, I consider myself dead to that word, Amen. right? And that's what it means to consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. There's no lack in God and there's no lack in his life. So when something tries to tell me I lack life, I see myself as being crucified with Christ to the death that's in the world. Right. I'm, and that do, does something in my heart where I say I'm dead to that life that Amen. can lack. Right. And I'm alive to a life that can never lack. And now I start walking around in newness of life. Right. You walk with the swag when you realize you have a life that contains all things. You walk with the swag. Right. Yeah, or like Glenn, you, you'd laugh at it. That's you right. Just laugh at it. You laugh at it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. You know, Amen. Gwen uh, brought up uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil the good side and the bad side and the way that we believed it before coming into grace was if you eat the good from the good side of the tree you'll have life and don't do the bad side but the fruit whether it be good or bad from that tree is all death that's right that's right yeah. it is indeed Amen. like birdie used to say it will kill you dead yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, I think that might be a good place to uh, wrap it up for this evening, unless someone has something they really want to bring up. Is anybody? No. I'll put you all on gal review so you can see everybody. There you go. Okay. We'll call it quits for tonight. Thank you all. It's been awesome. Absolutely awesome. And I'll get the recording out as soon as I can. Hey, Thank by you. the way, are you guys going to live stream Birdie? Yeah. What's that? Are you live streaming Birdie? Yes. Okay. All right. On yes. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. All three nights. All three nights. Right on. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll get my feelings. Love you all. Love you yeah. all. All right. Love, Love you all. Bye. Love getting together with the family. Love it. Love you.